next one down is station setup. Now within station setup, this is where you program all of the information on a per station basis. Now before I go into any of this, take a look at this. I'm going to come down to this right down here. This is the navigation bar. We've got like the first record, previous, next, and the last record. Also we have this little button here that says search as well. That's actually a flashlight that you're looking at there. If I select on this, then this, this will show me all of the different records that reside within whatever it is I'm looking at, and then I can jump to any given one, click on OK, I'm now on station 11. Coming down to the last one, you notice that we've got 20 stations pre-programmed into the system as well. I just want to point that out. If your installation does exceed beyond 20 stations, first of all, congratulations. Second of all, uh, you can add in additional ones. There's no limit to the number of stations you can program in. Just select on the plus sign to do that. The only limitation you may experience will be within the license manager because you're not licensed for X number of stations that you're programming into it. So just make sure you've got sufficient licensing for that as well. But in terms of the actual programming itself, there's no limit to that. All right, we also have a refresh as well. So as you make changes on the system, if you notice, hey, I made a change that didn't kick on through, just click on refresh, and it'll refresh whatever it is you got on the screen. Also, we have insert record as well to insert new ones. And this one here is actually a pen being held by a hand. And if you select on that, that's to edit the existing record. Also, what you can do as well is just click anywhere on this. And as soon as you make a change to anything, then it will go into an edit mode as well. Now, taking a look at what we have on the screen, first of all, we have the station ID here. Okay, so as I click on through, station 3, 4, 5, 6, and notice that the, the descriptions change appropriately with that as well. All right, the next thing we have over, uh, way over on the right here is is active. You're going to see is active all through the back office, and what this is, is the checkbox which identifies whether this record is physically active or not. If I uncheck a box like this, then basically this database record will be declared as inactive, which means it will emulate deletion. All right, coming back to what I mentioned in one of our earliest sessions, is that Pixel Point is well known for being stable. It's really well known for being uh, its stability and and uh, and it doesn't go down. It doesn't you know break down uh, certainly when you don't want it to. And um, part of that is the fact that we don't physically delete records on a regular basis. What we do is we just kind of set them as inactive, and this way the structure of that database remains intact, you know, whether the records are visible or not, whatever it happens to be. But the database itself is rigid, and so that's why we set these things as active and inactive. Remember, just I had mentioned this earlier in, in, the, in the previous session, if you ever need to retrieve a record that's been set as inactive, then all you have to do is come up to where it says Window, Show active records only. If I uncheck that, now what I can do is I can go in to, let's say, station, for example, if I disabled a station, and I would be able to see any inactive records. And if there were any, okay, there's one right there. Station 3 has been set as inactive. Then what I can do is just check on this, and station 3 is now active and visible on the system, and I can work with it again. All right, coming back to where we are here. Now, we're broken off into several tabs again. On this first tab, we have station options and all this kind of stuff pertaining to this given station that I'm working on being station one. As far as the descriptions go, I would probably just leave them as they are. Uh, they're, you know, they're pretty stable and it, it makes sense to everyone. The only exception would be maybe if you're in a foreign country and you need to program it in Spanish or French or whatever it happens to be. Coming over to the right-hand side, we have auto logout in seconds. Now, this is actually to help prevent uh, problems in the system where you've got table service and you've got users who are logging in and logging out on a regular basis. Now, what this does is, is that it will sit on the floor layout screen, the table layout screen, for X number of seconds. Uh, and if it's not touched by anyone, then it will automatically log that user out. Okay, so in here, for example, a, a typical example of this would be 20. I would put in something like 20. Now what that means is as follows. You and I are both waiters on the system. And you log in and you place you pick table 4 and you go and you place the order for that. And uh, then you send it off and you're sitting back on the table layout screen and you're not really thinking and you decide to walk away. And so it's sitting with you logged onto the system and the floor layout screen is, is sitting there. Me as Scott, the, the other waiter, I walk up to the system, and I'm not thinking either, and I see there's all the tables. I'm just, I'm just taking care of now this new order for table 9. So I select on table 9, I put in my order, and here we go. 
And so what happens now is that it's still logged in under your name. I put in the order for table nine, and guess what? You are now responsible for my table. And, and when I log out, then I won't be able to get back into my own table either. I'll need to come to you to be able to do that. So what this does is that if you walk away from the station and it's sitting on the floor layout screen and it's sitting there for 20 seconds, then the system is going to say, you know what, I think we've just kind of abandoned this, this uh, station, so I'm going to just automatically log you out and it'll be ready for the next person. So that's what that's intended for. If you leave it at zero, then it'll just stay as it is. As long as it's one or more, then it's going to it's going to start uh, counting. Don't do it for one or five seconds because people won't have time to do anything. All right, the next thing down here is this station uses the following. Now, we have here a number of different selections that have, that's available to us uh, within menu. Pixel Point can handle multiple menus. Now, what I mean by multiple menus is, for example, picture walking into a mall and you go to the food court. So here we have a food court with all of these different shops that sell different things, burgers and sandwiches and, and uh, salads, and another one that sells pizza, and another one that sells Chinese food, and whatever it happens to be. And all of those different restaurants could actually be on one pixel point system. They all have different menus, they all have different staff, they all have different hours of operation, and they all have different layouts of their screen as well. The screen can look entirely unique to each one of those establishments. When you go in to set up the pixel point system on all these different things, then all you have to do is just go into here and identify which menu they are using. You've all, there's another place that you go to identify the, the template that they use for that and what the contents would be within each one of those. That's all within menu setup I'll be showing you later on. But in here, this is where you identify the menu that this particular station uses. So for example, if I'm working on stations one and two at the beginning of this food court, and it happens to be uh, an A&W restaurant, then I would have an A&W uh, menu in here, and I would identify on those two stations, I want to use the A&W menu. If the next one over happens to be KFC, then stations three and four, I identify within here as the KFC menu which case then when you log into each one of these respective stations, the menu that shows up on the screen when you, when you open up a check will be uh, A&W or KFC or whatever it happens to be that you're programming into the system. Take a look underneath that, using order form, blah, blah, blah. So this identifies as far as the particular template that is being used for that given um, menu. All right, and we'll take a look again at, at menu setup uh, much further on uh, into this course. All right, the next thing we have here is alternate order form. And so what you can select within here is an alternate uh, form uh, ordering screen. That's what this is right here, using order form, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is where you can set up an alternate one in here. Why would we have an alternate one? Because it depends on the resolution. For example, let's say stations one and two for my A&W restaurant are two different pieces of equipment, okay? And um, I'm just short on a budget, so one station is set up and it's, a, it's got a 1024 by 768 display. The other one will be using the same menu, but the order uh, form that I'm gonna use for this is set up for an 800 by 600 screen, just because I'm working with different resolutions and things like that. So if that is the case, you can actually use the same menu, but a different template for these different stations as well. So this way you don't have to duplicate all this kind of stuff. You can just actually identify within here that station one will use the 1024 and that station two will you will also use the same menu but use the alternate form of the 800 by 600 uh, display for example. Coming down below that, we've got other forms that are available within here. All of these forms, I should point out, just as a little sneak preview, are designed under Form Designer, which we'll be taking a look probably within the next session. The first thing we have here is finish forms, okay? So when you go to the finish screen, I want to identify how that finish screen is going to look. Uh, just like the order screen, it is completely customizable, so you can have different uh, finish screens or settlement screens on a per station basis. Also, we have question forms as well. Now, when forced questions come up, there's several different ways they can appear on the, on the system. They can appear like in a, in a list where you can select from there. They can also appear in a big window where you select the buttons and so on. Um, and of some other ways as well. I'll, I'll talk about that later on. But another way is like in a kiosk application where I have a specific form or screen set up for forced questions to 
to display, in which case it'll have the, the solution, the, or the selections will appear maybe within a picture type format or, or some special graphic text or something. And I can have a pretty screen anyway with my force questions. And so you can identify that on a first station basis. Also within here, we have theme form. Theme being the color of the pixel point system. You'll see, for example, here I've got blue showing up <coughs> Excuse me, within my back office. And this is reflected also within the front end as well. My stuff shows up in blue. If I want to change the color scheme of the pixel point system, uh, you know how it used to be yellow, now it's the part blue. But we also have a number of different ones that are available within the system, and you can actually identify what color scheme or, or theme that you want to use for this. Again, to make it a little more appropriate to the establishment. You, know, you want to match up with the decor of the establishment. Make it look like this point of sale system was written right from scratch specifically for this restaurant so that it looks like it's part of the whole thing. And if that's the case, then you can actually go about changing the, to a different theme within here as well. Well, again, we'll take a look a, a little more at that when we uh, get into Form Designer. Underneath that, we have Floor File. Now, this is an FLR file extension. And what they, we have here is your table layout. This is for table layout situations or di dining, dining situations, where um, you actually go in and you place table one, two, three, and four in a certain space and so on, how you want it to look and so on. And then when you start up this station uh, for table service, then boom, here's the floor layout as it appears as you programmed into the system. And in here you're tagging, I want this particular floor layout on this particular station to look this way. Okay, Picture this for a moment, and this is a good thing for salespeople, is that you've got um, four stations, one located in each corner of a very large room. And in the middle of the room, you've got all of your tables laid out for your guests to sit and dine. And what you could potentially do if you wanted is you can have four different FLR or floor layout files programmed into the system, one, each one uh, reflecting the floor layout from the perspective of that station. So if I'm at station three, for example, and I'm looking at uh, the layout of the floors from where I'm standing right now, I, I can actually have a floor layout that would match what I'm looking at from where I am. Whereas if I went over to station two, I'd be looking at it from another angle from that corner of the room, and I could have another floor file for that. So there's uh, lots of stuff you can do with that, and you can have different floor files programmed into the system, and you tag on the appropriate one that you want for this given station. Coming over to the right-hand side, we have, uh, let me see, customer display. Now, Pixel Point will work with stations that have customer displays or, or dual screen uh, display systems. Uh, and PAR offers, offers those. So if I'm Scott the customer and I'm facing you and you're placing my order, I actually have a screen in front of me that's showing my order as it appears. And to do that, all you have to do is just select on this and you identify, okay, this will be you know, customer display 1024. You know, let's say it's an 800 by 600 display. So I select on that and whatever you have programmed into the system as the customer display for that, that's what's going to show up on the screen. And again, completely customizable in terms of how it looks and, and what it contains and so on. Now you'll notice that upon selecting that, I now have this new field that show up called Screen Saver. Again, this is designed for the customer display. And this is what happens. I get this showing up on that screen when I'm in a transaction. When I'm not in a transaction, what shows up on that screen? Well, you can have a Screen Saver set up for that as well. So it may have some advertising or some the local weather or whatever you know, might be of interest to, to customers to look at when you're not in the middle of a transaction. And so uh, in that case, you can actually program in this, the screensaver in there, and this is what will show up on, this, on that uh, customer display screen. If I take out the one above, then the one below is gone as well. Coming down below that, we have keyboard form. Now, by default, the conventional North American, this is the way we do it, keyboard, this is referred to as the QWERTY keyboard, uh, is what shows up on the system here, this is the default one. QWERTY is, is the English uh, conventional keyboard. If you take a look at your keyboard in front of you, if you have one, uh, you start in the top left corner, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, okay, are the first few letters, and that's how you identify that as being um, a North American keyboard. If you happen to be listening in from France, for example, you would be using an AVERTY keyboard. A-V-E-R-T-Y, because the A would be in the top left position. 
Uh, and if there's any other specialized ones, you can do that as well. One of the thing, things Form Designer will allow you to do is program in your own custom keyboards as well. So not only can you have all those keys, but you can program in additional function buttons in there as well. In some cases, that may be quite useful. For example, if you're doing a lot with driving directions, you can actually create entire buttons that uh, instead of having an ABCD, or you can have those in there as well, but also have buttons that say street, avenue, boulevard, north, south, east, west, whatever it happens to be like that. And you can come up with a really customized keyboard if, if desired. And then you can program it here on a per station basis. Coming down below that, we have floor zoom, 1 to 1,000% and defaults to 100%, which means when you're setting up your floor layout as it appears on the screen, if you're just trying to tweak it a little bit, you can actually zoom in and out, maybe up and down one or two percentages just to make it uh, match up exactly with your screen and your resolution that you're working with. Uh, but also as well, if you find that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm programming all this in, but it's very common for me to be working on a station that's in a banquet hall, and I need to fit about 300 tables in there, so I need them really small. If that's the case, then you can actually adjust the zoom out percent on that given station, so that when you go into it, then it'll really pull back from the floor layout to allow you to see more tables, or fewer tables, depending on your situation. Coming down below that, we have some check boxes here. The first one is always print receipt on close. Pretty self-explanatory, which means that whenever you close a check, print the receipt. Next one down is station has magnetic card reader attached. Now, this is actually a little wordy, but I'll tell you what it does. Remember on the login screen, when you log into the front end, you've got the manual login button. If you want to remove that button from the front end, then just check on this box, which means you can only do magnetic card swipe. This is actually really good for situations where you have a station, maybe a, a large a large uh, complex, for example, that has a lot of employees, and you have one station that's actually dedicated for nothing but logging in and out of staff. If that is the case, they need their card reader, so, or they need their, their magnetic card in, in order to log in and log out or clock it and clock out. And if that's the case, then you can check or uncheck that box for it. Uh, if you just leave it as it is, then you'll have manual login available so people can manually log in. But they can also use any of the other methods that I've described earlier on as well. Print type of sale on orders. Pretty self-explanatory as well. When I print off an order to a kitchen or to a bar, then I can put on this have included on it as well the type of sale, whether it's dine-in or takeout or pickup or delivery or whatever it happens to be, then you can include that within there as well. Coming off to the right-hand side, we have default sale type. So within here, on station one, when I go into to the thing, what sale type will be the default for that? And in there, I can set it to dine-in, or if this is at a, a takeout counter, for example, I can have it set to pickup, or maybe at a, a delivery section, I can set it for delivery. If it's room service, I may program in a new sale type for that and set that as the default sale type, whatever it happens to be. Revenue center. Now, we haven't quite talked too much about revenue centers yet, but basically a revenue center is a profit center. I want you to picture for a moment a hotel. In this hotel, we've got the nightclub, we've got the lounge, and we've got the coffee shop. Each one of those is its own menu, its own staff, its own management, yet they're all sharing on that same point of sale system, much like what I mentioned with the, uh, uh, with the food court as well, same situation. Each one of those is a profit center or a revenue center. And within here, you can actually create multiple revenue centers. And in this, you identify, in this particular case, which stations apply to which revenue centers. So if I did have, for example, coming back to our food court, one for A&W and one for KFC, then station one would be an A&W, station three would be a KFC. Coming over to the next one, we have printer ports. Now, on yours, you'll see there's probably a full set of, of uh, names all running down here. I've cleared off a few. These are referred to as printer channels. Printer channels are basically a classification or a, a, a path that a print job would take in order to get to its des printing destination. I'll talk more about printers uh, later on in, a, in a, a later session where I go through the concepts of printing and so on. But as far as what I've got here, these, these are pretty easy to figure out. Local, kitchen, and bar, which means local means a local printer. Any kind of printing that is done on a local printer, such as anything related to um, uh, credit card checks, for credit card slips, for example, printing a check, printing a receipt, those are all local printing, anything transaction-oriented. Uh, and so on there, 
that would be my first printer channel. Underneath that, if I order any kind of food, I want it to print to a printer in the kitchen, for example. So I would have a channel set up for that. All my food would print to a printer, a kitchen printer channel. And then bar as well. So if I order a beer or a glass of wine, I want it to print to the bar. So it would follow that path or that channel to uh, the respective bar. And so I've got one set up for that. I'll talk about more printer channels and so on again later on. But in here, uh, off to the right-hand side on station one, you identify as far as which particular printer am I going to print to on this given thing. Okay, so in this, uh, what you do is you lay out on a per station basis. If I order a sandwich or food from station one, what printer do I want to go to? I identify that within here. Okay, I'll say kitchen eight, for example. Okay, if I order a drink from, kit from station one, what printer do I want to go to? And on here, then I couldn't look in here. OK, there's my bar printer. I'll go to that. And so this way, this manages as far as the printing mechanics of the printing uh, from station one. So depending on what type of item I order, this is where it's going to print if I order it from station one. Because I may have, like again, a big entertainment complex. You know, I might have 20 stations. I might have three bars. I might have 15 printers. So you really need to identify as far as where each of these is going to go and map them out within here. Coming off to the right-hand side, we have advanced options here. I'm going to just turn these off so I don't get any error messages showing up in the front end. Coming off the right-hand side, advanced options should be one. One represents the first printer channel. The first printer channel here is local. It should always be local. And if it is always local, because every point of sale system needs to be able to print a check. If it doesn't print a check, it's not much of a point of sale system. It may not have a kitchen. It may not have a bar but it will need to print a check. So local is always your first printer channel. And within here, all of these ones mean that these respective tasks will be activated via that printer channel. Okay, Because, for example, when, quite often when you're uh, plugging in cash drawers, for example, they actually plug into the local printer. There's actually ports in there for that. And so the drawer is kicked open based on the print job that's going through to that printer. And so in here, this, this will identify that. And as you can see, we've got three drawers that you can actually tag in to this as well, because Pixel Point will accommodate up to three cash drawers per station. Okay, Not all hardware handles that. Some, Many of them just handle two cash drawers. But Pixel Point will allow up to three. Also, receipt printer as well. So if I want a receipt to print, then I leave that at one. And when I print it off, then it's going to kick onto that. Now, you'll see down here I've got a whole separate channel I created here called Receipt Audit. Okay, I'm Scott, the manager, and I've got a receipt printer in my office. And every time someone prints a check, I want a copy of it in my office as well. So what I did was I actually created a channel for that. I identified my printer being audit number five, for example. And uh, that's, that's the printer that's assigned to it. And then in here, where it comes to receipt printer, I've got a one. And this is channel number nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So in here, I'm going to put a one and then a nine. Now, that's not actually 19. You don't need a, a comma in there because there's only nine printer channels. But in this, I put in a one and a nine. So that way, whenever someone prints a check and it goes through, it's, it's, the receipt is printed through on the local receipt printer. Then it will also go through to channel number nine, which is my audit printer. So I'll have two printouts of that, one at each end. Uh, we also have charge slip printers as well. A charge slip uh, printer is where you actually take uh, like a cardboard or, or a pre-printed uh, check. You slide it into the printer, hit the button, and it goes chunk 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 like this, and it prints off everything on that pre-printed check. We also have report printer as well. Any kind of reports, such as uh, your end of day, for example, or your cash out reports, uh, all that kind of stuff is activated through the local printer as well. You will never need to, in 99.9% .9 of the time, you'll never need to change any of these. So you can just leave them as they are. The next one over is fonts. Within here, this is all fonts within the pixel point system that pertains to this given station. So this is for things, for example, like you know how the text looks on uh, manual login, on the login screen, or all of the function buttons that show up along the blue bar down at the bottom where you've got things like quantity and logout and your settings and, and all that kind of stuff. That is what all this text pertains to within here. Uh, there's a variety of them all through this. And if, if for any reason you need to change that text around, like the how, it, how the text appears, then actually you can change them within here. And again, this is on a per station basis. 99.9% .9 of the time, you'll never need to change it. But you can do that within here. All right, coming over to the Advanced tab. 
Uh, within here, we've got all kinds of things that pertain to, again, this given station. The first thing here is station price level. This is the first of four areas where you can actually assign different price levels to items. Now, a price level being, for example, if I order a cheeseburger, I pay, let's say, $3. Now, if I order a cheeseburger, but I'm Scott the member, I may pay $2. Or if I order it from station one specifically, I may pay $5. Whereas if I order from station two, I may pay $3. You know, all different circumstances like this. Pixel Point allows up to 10 price levels that you can program into it and four areas where you can apply these different levels. Now in here, the first one being um, station by station number. So on this, I can program, for example, all right, there's price level A, force price level A. So if I have $3 for my cheeseburger in there, then on station one, I would pay that price. Now if I went over to station two, I can say force price level B in which case then I pay a different price, if, if the prices were different, on station two. And there are actually establishments that do this, that based on the station that you're ordering from, you can actually force across a different price. This is really good actually, for example, where you are in a hotel and you have, let's say, station seven. And station seven is uh, the station for handling room service. And so if that is the case, you can actually force the room service price level onto that given station so that whenever I order things, I'll be ordering off the conventional menu, but the price will actually be adjusted to allow for room service, that kind of thing. So, now we also have different areas here as well. The the, uh, the three um, areas where you can also apply price levels. The first one being schedule pricing, which is handled through report categories. I'll talk about that when we get to it. Also, member groups, as I said, for example, I'm Scott the member. Now I can have seniors pricing, student pricing, VIP pricing, for example, and you can set it up so that station one would, would honor pricing based on the member group that you're using. And we also have based on sale type as well. So within here, again, if I have like a sale type of, of uh, room service, I can have a whole price level for that. And I would pay a different price again if it's for delivery and another price if it's pickup and another price if it's dine-in. So you can have all these different forms of pricing as well. Coming down below that, we also have warehouse depletion. Now, warehouse depletion is for inventory situations where you are working with multiple warehouses. Now, in this, I can actually break it out. So, for example, um, a warehouse can be some, let's say, like a bar refrigerator. Okay, you got uh, several different bars in this big entertainment complex, and they all have their respective refrigerators behind the bars, and those are set up as as uh, warehouses. So, depending on what stations are ordering from what bar, you can actually identify within here which uh, a bar refrigerator they're going to actually be pulling from as well using uh, this. So you can program all of that in there and break it out on a warehouse depletion on a per station basis. I'll talk more about that when we get into inventory. Underneath that we have quick order table number. Now within here we have, again I, I mentioned earlier on, you know, there's when in doubt the answer is there's no limit. And when it comes to table numbers and tables in general, there is no limit to the number of tables that you can program into a pixel point system. But there are some things that we've kind of reserved aside for sp certain uh, specific functions. Uh, one of them being the 30,000 series of tables. Okay, from 30,000 up to 32,000, you can actually assign filters for these uh, tables within these different station layouts. And what they do is allow you to filter uh, saved checks and get checks. They're an auto split table or auto split check. Okay, so for example, I pull up to a drive through and I order my meal and that is actually saving through to table 30,000. Next guy pulls up, he orders his meal, you save that check as well. It's saving through to that same table 30,000. And the next guy pulls up and the same thing again. And what will happen is every time you save a check, to one of these 30,000 tables, then it will auto-split that. So now you've got a split check with each one of these drive-through orders, uh, separate drive-through orders on it. And uh, within this particular filter here, what it allows you to do is actually isolate specific ta uh, specific stations to these, um, these auto-split tables. So this way, if I'm working with multiple windows, for example, let's say I got two drive-through lanes going, and they each have their own respective windows. And on these, I've got stations one and two are handling drive through A, three and four are handling drive through B. Well, they're all saving checks, they're all retrieving checks, but you don't want them to get all mixed up and confused. So what you can do then is within here, you can identify stations one and two will use 30,001, stations three and four will use stations, will use table 30,002. 
And this way, when all those auto splits come through, they'll come through to different separate tables. And then from there, you've got no overlapping of these saved orders. That's a mouthful and quite a lot to swallow within your brain, but kind of just uh, go with that. <laughs> you can always click on rewind and have Scott explain that again. But it's also explained within the manuals as well. Okay, next down we have print receipt reminder message. Okay, smile and say thank you. So whenever you print a receipt, this little bulletin message will show up on the screen. This is a friendly reminder for whatever it is you want to reply across to your, your staff and make sure that they're aware of it. And then I'll, I'll just uh, stop on this last one, and then we'll, we'll kick on for a break. Kiosk employee. One of the things that uh, PixelPoint can do is you can program it for kiosk applications. It's a self-ordering self station. And, if, and that being the case, if I do program station one, for example, to be a kiosk station, then I need the system to be able to automatically log in as soon as a customer walks up and touches the screen. And so to do that, you can actually program in a kiosk employee in here, and all kiosk sales will be allocated to that pseudo employee on the system. And this kind of allows you to override the whole security logging in and logging out uh, on a per transaction basis that we conventionally would do with any other employee. Okay, I'm just going to pause on where we are right now. We're at uh, roughly 2 o'clock my local time. And uh, we're going to just uh, take a break for about five minutes. Uh, the next thing we have down the right-hand side is all these little check boxes that perform different things on a per station basis. The first one here is play animation on main screen. Now you may recall when we go into the login screen, you've got that cute little uh, EverServe graphic that shows up on there. And, and as great as it looks, uh, sometimes it uses up some resources. And so if that is the case, what you can actually do is turn that off if you find it's, it's getting to be a, a little too intensive on your, your hardware. And so by, by unchecking play animation on main screen, what you'll have is a static logo showing up on there. And all of that cycling through with all the custom graphics and, in, and stuff that I had described in the first session, um, that will not show up on there either. It'll just be a static image. All right, the next one down is disable save get check function. Okay, save check and get check. Uh, I briefly kind of glanced on this with uh, a number of different applications uh, up to this point. This is for a quick service environment where I've got, for example, you know, I'm doing burger cash, burger cash, and then for whatever reason, I need to save a check on the system, but I'm not dealing with a table. <clears throat> so you can actually, in a quick service environment, select on save check. That will actually save that check onto the system, and then if I want to retrieve it, either on this station or any other station, then I can select on get check. It'll come up with a list of all saved checks. I select on that one, and I can retrieve it and, and carry on with it. Very common for drive-through environments, for example. If I want to remove that functionality altogether, just select on Disable Saved Get Check Function, and it will, those buttons will not appear. The next one down here is Disable Floor Zoom and Out Buttons. Okay, so remember on the table layout screen, we had the Zoom In, Zoom Out buttons. If you want to take them out, just uncheck that, or check that, I should say. All right, now the next one down here. Tax inclusive pricing when feature code equals one. Okay, there's a mouthful right there. Now, what this pertains to is the use of tax inclusive pricing. This is VAT, remember uh, value added tax I mentioned earlier on in the previous session. And this will allow you to apply this on a per item basis on a per station basis. Now, uh, this is very common for North America uh, where you've got, for example, a food menu and a bar menu. Anyone who's installed in, in restaurants, you understand that uh, it's very common where you'll have a separate bar menu, and the bar menu will have all the prices, and they include all applicable taxes. But you only want that on the bar items. You don't want it on the food items. So if that is the case, within product setup, we have this field called feature code, and you can put in different numbers to do different things. And one of them, the most common one, is feature code 1, which means that this particular item I'm programming into the system the price I put in there will include all applicable taxes. So what PixelPoint does, it internally back calculates the amount of, of the, the item for you, and then from there adds on the applicable taxes to bring it up to the price that you've put in for it. So for example, if I have a beer, so I'm programming a beer into the system, I give it a price of $4, and I have several different uh, taxes that apply to that, but I want the final total to be $4, then you can actually uh, apply feature code 1 to that item. Now, on a per station basis, you can identify within here, I want station one to be able to honor that. If I order that beer from this station, then I've got this check, which means it will be $4, including tax. If I program in station two, I can uncheck that box, in which case then, when I order that same beer on station two, it will be $4 plus tax. 
Okay, so there's two ways you can do it here, just based on this little checkbox indicating tax inclusive pricing when feature code equals one. This will determine whether this station will honor that or not. The next thing we have here is start quick order mode in transaction view. And this also works in conjunction with start quick order summary by default as well. <clears throat> now, within here, one of the things you may recall that we took a look at when we were in the front end was this button on the right hand side underneath the legend called transaction view. I selected on that and that brought up a list of, of uh, all of the different saved checks on the system. Really good for a bartender, for example, who's running tabs and so on. You can select on any one of them. It shows the contents of that check and then from there you can select on use check to use the check and so on. Now, I may want to program this particular station as the bar station and I want it to default to that particular view then what you can do is you can just select on uh, start quick order mode in transaction view, in which case then I'll have that screen show up. If I'd have it unchecked, then in quick, in, uh, in quick order mode, I would just have a blank check up on the screen and go beer cash, beer cash, burger cash, burger cash. But if I want to have that screen up, then I check on this box and it will display with that. Underneath that, we also have display the order summary by that, whether you want to include that summary of here's the summary of all the information that's showing up in there, and when you select on any given check, and if you check or uncheck that, then that will determine whether that box will also be included within that display or not. Coming down below that, disable transaction view from floor layout. Okay, so within here, if I don't even want that transaction view button to appear on the, ta on the table layout screen, then I can select on this and it disappears. Disable auto gratuity. Now, you may recall that in system setup, there was the auto gratuity that I was programming in, 15% if there's $200 or more and so on. And on here, on a per station basis, I can determine that station one will honor or not honor that particular auto gratuity. So again, the gratuity may apply on station one, but not on station two. And then finally, we have sale auth, no pre-auth. Now, this is going to show up several times within the back office because there's several different ways you can program this. What sale auth, no pre-auth does is this determines how tips will be applied um, for charge transactions. Now, the way tipping works is, or even charge transactions works is as follows. When you're programming for a... Um, a, a hospitality restaurant, especially table service, for example, what the what happens here is that the order will go through to the bank and it will pre-authorize it and come back saying, yes, this thing is authorized for that. But within that, it will be with the allowance and expectation of a possible charge tip to be applied to it as well. So I got a $100 transaction, goes across to the bank, comes back approved. I can still add on a $10 or $20 tip, charge tip on top of that. And it will still go through and be honored within the, uh, the credit service or the bank. Um, but what you can do on a per station basis is say, if I do a charge transaction on station number one, I do not want to have that, uh, that charge tip required uh, for that transaction. So basically, it will just regard it as $100 transaction, boom, goes through here, that's it, it's ready to go. It will automatically assume a $0 tip, charge tip for that. Why would I do that? Because station one may be in a gift shop. Okay, so in a gift shop, you know, I, I pick up a newspaper, a pack of gum, whatever it happens to be. It's kind of retail type application. Uh, but I'm still on the same POS as all those other stations that are in the restaurant that's right next to me. So if that is the case, then on those, I would uncheck this, in which case then, you know, if I do a credit card transaction, then it is going to require that I, I apply a tip to those charge transactions. But if I do a charge, charge transaction on station one in the gift shop, I can check on that, which case then tipping will not be required for those transactions. The last thing we have for station setup is receipt setup. Now you'll see right now it defaults to nothing. And the reason being is that when you're se there's another place actually within back office to go about setting up the receipt uh, and how it's going to look for all subsequent receipts that whenever you print a check, print a receipt. And this is where you set up the header and footer. Now what you can do is on a per station basis, you can actually put in a custom receipt for this which case then I can put in as far as the header being, here's the name of the, the establishment and so on like that, then the contents of your check, and then down the bottom of it, then I have the footer on that as well. This is what shows up after the contents of your check. And in here, you can program in all of these different things on a per station basis. Now, I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just kind of leave things as they are right now. I'm not going to go into detail on this. The reason being is that I will be covering, just so I can have something to cover when I get to receipt setup, 
under the general setup pull down menu. Uh, but by default here, you would want to leave this as, as as empty because if you do it within the, the conventional one under general setup, that applies to all stations. Uh, whereas if you do it within here, you have to program it on a per station basis. And that in itself is fine uh, with the exception that if I add on a station later on, then I may forget to do it and, I, and it may show up as you know your your bar and grill or something like that as opposed to the the actual name of the establishment. So uh, if you can, don't do it in here. Do it on the regular one. Just do it in here when it has to be different, let's say by revenue center, for example.